Now let's consider what might happen if there are no black markets, there's no bribes, and let's also imagine that buyers don't compete with each other by waiting in long lines, okay? Or at least the, um, the amount of time they spend waiting in line doesn't correspond with their willingness to pay, okay? Let's think about like the role of chance. When there is a, um, a shortage of a good, if you show up to buy it, you know, it could be the case that this buyer right here, who has a very low value, happens to get to the store before this buyer up here who has a very high value. And so this buyer manages to purchase the good. He's willing to pay that price. Just a, He's willing to pay just a little bit more than that price, and he manages to capture it, okay? Whereas maybe this buyer, who had a high willingness to pay, he shows up late to the party. By the time he gets to the store, there's no goods available, and so society loses that value, right? The difference between his willingness to pay and the controlled price. That represents a misallocation of resources, and that can be a really serious problem uh, when you have a price control. Oftentimes, in the United States anyway, most of the time that price controls go into effect is after natural disasters, where, and I'm gonna, uh, I pl I'm planning on making a separate video on this with regards to price controls in COVID-19, so stay tuned. But basically, after a natural disaster, the equilibrium price tends to go up because people demand more of a lot of products, there might also be a reduction in supply. Both of those things push the uh, the equilibrium price up. But in under states of emergency, commonly it's illegal to raise your price above what it used to be in equilibrium. And so you end up with shortages of a lot of goods that people need after a natural disaster. One of those things might be ice, right? If you have power knocked out by a natural disaster, uh, your freezer's not working anymore, your refrigerator's not working anymore, so people desperately want to get their hands on some ice. And you can imagine different uses of that ice, okay? Somewhere in this region, that might be, you know, keeping your food cool so that you can, uh, you know, preserve it and continue to feed yourself over the long term. Up here, this might be, you know, people who have certain medications, like um, if you're an insulin-dependent diabetic, you've got to keep that insulin refrigerated, otherwise it's not going to do you uh, any good. And so you might be willing to pay very high prices to, uh, to get enough ice to, um, you know, to keep your medication good. And then down here in these lower valued uses, this might be, you know, keeping your beer cold or putting some ice in, in your water because it's hot outside and it would be convenient for you to, to cool yourself off a little bit. And those are relatively frivolous uses, right? And so people wouldn't be willing to pay particularly high prices to keep their beer cold uh, or to cool down their, uh, their drinks. But under the circumstances, when the government is keeping the price this low, they, they don't have to pay high prices in order to keep their be beer cold. And so if they get the chance to buy that ice, they're going to do it. When what we would prefer is if you have a frivolous use for this ice, we want you to leave it on the store shelves or rather leave it in the, um, you know, the, uh, the deep freeze that the, the store is using so that it can be freed up for the people who need to cool their medications and the people who need to, uh, you know, keep their food cold. All right. So let's think about the loss of consumer surplus under this kind of random allocation of resources. Uh, they talk about this in uh, one of the videos, Tyler uh, Cowan and Alex Tabarrok discussed this. Uh, so I'm gonna go over this, you know, not in a lot of detail, but here's the basic idea. This entire segment of the demand curve is going to receive a random allocation. Now, if I just, throw out these goods and one of them happens to go to the person with this high uh, value, then that's going to be a lot of consumer surplus on that one transaction. On the other hand, if I throw out these goods and, and one of them goes to this buyer here at QD, whose value for that good is exactly equal to that low price P bar, well then there's zero consumer surplus. And obviously people in the middle, if they get it, they're gonna get intermediate uh, amounts of consumer surplus out of that purchase, okay? Now, supposing that this was purely random, we just have like a lottery, and, and if you have a winning lottery ticket, we, we hand out QS raffle tickets, for example. Um, oh no, sorry, we hand out QD raffle tickets, but then we only select QS of them to actually give people um, goods. We're gonna end up allocating randomly along this demand curve, 
okay? And if you run the statistics on it, what you'll find is on average, some of the people are gonna, you know, you're gonna give some high, uh, some of the goods to high valued uses, some to people in the middle, some uh, down low. But on average, what you're gonna do is split the difference between the maximum of this demand curve and the, uh, the legislated price, okay? By split the difference, I mean, on average, you expect it to be right here in the middle between them. I'm gonna call that the average willingness to pay. And the formula for the average willingness to pay, remember, the y-intercept of the demand curve is yd. The average willingness to pay is equal to the y-intercept of the demand curve plus the legislated price divided by two, all right? The, that, that gives us the average of those two prices, and it turns out that's gonna be the average value of the buyer along this demand curve, assuming that this demand curve is linear. It's a straight line, right? So if you allocate randomly, the average value to each consumer is right there. You're handing out QS of these things. And so this will be the consumer surplus. And this area right here, that represents the loss from misallocation. Okay. Now, I'm not going to ask you to calculate the area of, uh, of this shape here, but let's just go through a quick example of calculating the consumer surplus under uh, random allocation. So let's say that we have a value of yd equal to 100. In other words, the most that any buyer would be willing to pay is $100. Let's say that the legislated price here, let's call that $10. And let's say that the quantity of units that are being sold, this QS, let's call that 100 units, all right? Keep everything base 10 so it, the, the calculation is pretty simple. Okay, so we wanna find the area of this rectangle right here. How are we gonna do it? Well, first of all, we need to find this height right here, which is gonna be the average willingness to pay minus the, uh, the legislated price. Well, first let's find the average willingness to pay. That is equal to the y-intercept of the demand curve plus the legislated price divided by two, which is 100 plus 110 is 110 divided by two, 55, okay? So now we know that this is 55, and we want to find the difference between 55 and the legislated price. Consumer surplus will be 55 minus the legislated price of $10 times the 100 units that are trading in this market. This is 45 times 100. So consumer surplus in this market would be $4,500. Okay. Now uh, I'm gonna stop this video here and give you a part two of misallocation of resources. And this one is not covered exactly by Tabarrok and Cowan, but hopefully it'll be a useful illustration.